Welcome to worship. Welcome on this second Sunday of Advent. God's blessings be with you all. This year, the Holy Evangelist, St. Mark, greets us to lead us through a new church year. He does not, however, greet us as we might expect. For one thing, he seems to have forgotten all about Christmas. At least Matthew and Luke tell of Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger, and of angels and shepherds. But Mark, what about Mark? While Christmas is the earthly beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, this preacher means that his entire gospel, the whole biblical story, is but the beginning of the gospel. It is as if he means to say that the Baptist call to repentance comes to us in Medias Res, that is, in the middle of everything else. In the middle of the biblical story and in the middle of our lives and activities right now, Jesus comes to us in the middle of chaos, in the middle of confusion, in the middle of COVID, and also in the middle of church and celebrations. He is saying, stop what you're doing. Repent again and welcome the greater one, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Christian faith and life is one of continual repentance and faith. Watch and listen as our Lord comes to us again. Now, by his spirit, in his word. And so we begin our service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We go to God with our confession. Prepare the way of the Lord, recalling our baptism into Christ. We confess our sins to God in the full assurance 
of the gift of forgiveness by the mighty sacrifices of his son. O God, from the wilderness of lives disfigured and crushed by the devil, our own sin and the sins of others, we cry out to you for the forgiveness of our sins, those that trouble us, as well as those of which we are not yet aware. Restore our life and faith by your own command, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And brothers and sisters, upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today on the second Sunday of Advent, we light the second purple candle, the Bethlehem candle or the candle of preparation. God kept his promise of a savior who would be born in Bethlehem. Preparation means to get ready. Help us to be ready to welcome you, O God. As is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. Luke 3, verses 4 through 6. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Let your light scatter the darkness and illuminate your church, the body of believers. Oh, come, desire of the 
The gospel reading comes to us today from Mark, the first chapter, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. God's grace, God's mercy, God's peace be to you, my brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. The church celebrates this time before Christmas differently than our secular culture. The secular culture jumps the gun on Christmas in a way while the church in the season of Advent continues to wait, anticipate, look forward to the coming of Christ. Likewise, very different visitors appear at this time in the church and in the world. In the world, you have the ever-present character of Santa Claus, a jolly old man, obviously well-fed, who wears a telltale kind of clothing and knows whether you've been naughty or nice. In the church, a different man appears in Advent, John the Baptist. Would we call him jolly? Probably not. Well-fed? Uh, if you like eating locusts and wild honey. He does wear a telltale kind of clothing, though, camel hair and a leather belt. And John's call for repentance shows that he knows you've been naughty or nice. So today, the sermon isn't about Santa Claus, but John the Baptist. But the sermon is also not about John the Baptist. It's about the one John the Baptist prepared for. It's about the one greater than John. Like John's preaching itself, today's sermon isn't about John. It's really about Jesus. Listen to John's voice and hear about Jesus. John's voice is a voice breaking the silence. The voice of prophecy had been silent in Israel for some 400 years, not since the prophet Malachi and the last book in the Old Testament had a prophet spoken. So when John bursts on the scene and speaks his prophetic sermon, he breaks a long silence. John also hearkens back to that final prophetic word by himself fulfilling a prophecy from Malachi's last chapter, that the prophet Elijah would be sent to prepare the way for the Lord. And remember, God always keeps his promises. John was not Elijah reincarnated or something silly like that, but he was in the spirit of Elijah and of all the prophets, predicting the fulfillment of God's long-awaited messianic promise. John wore the clothing of a prophet, dressed very similar to Elijah himself. His garb and his lifestyle were humble, also a witness against decadence and materialism. He resided in the desert and evoked that prophecy of Isaiah 40. In the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. John's prophetic voice and rather odd actions may stick out in our minds as weird, but there was a purpose behind it all. All these things pointed to something deeper about John the Baptist, something which is still worthy of our attention, which is John's message. Repent! 
Repent. He is near. Repent. The king is near. Most of us think of John the Baptist as a baptizer. Perhaps you even picture him in waist-high water in the Jordan River. Or maybe reaching down to pick up a few drops from the bottom of a dusty stream bed. Whatever it was, some scholars estimate that John baptized somewhere between 200,000 and maybe even up to a half a million people. But what really caused such a stir was not that John baptized. Baptisms were quite common back then. Ritual washings of all sort had been around since the dawn of human history in all manners of religious systems. Even in the Judaism of John's day, Gentile converts were baptized to bring them under the covenant. So why all the fuss about John then? It wasn't his baptism per se. What then caused the sensation that was John the Baptist? Well, even Jesus, humorously, of course, asked the same question in Luke chapter 7. What did you go out in the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge themselves in luxury live in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you and more than a prophet. Yes, John was a prophet. And a prophet is a messenger. And it was the message of John that drew all the attention. It was his sermon, his preaching, that made the bigger splash than the baptism alone. John's message perhaps summed up best in one word. Repent! Repent! It means there is a sin that needs to be dealt with. But it also suggests there is a way of dealing with it. Repentance is more than just being sorry, you see. It means contrition, sorrow for sin, faith in the one who forgives it, and a turning or changing of the heart and of the mind so that good works may follow. John's preaching of repentance was not just a harsh slap in the face. It was also an anticipation, a preparation for the fulfillment of God's greatest promise. In fact, his baptism went right along with his message, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And it was a baptism which pointed forward to one who would bring a greater baptism. One who would win the forgiveness that John was offering. In a very real sense, John was preaching about Jesus, his Savior, and ours. John's Savior was one greater than I. And John's sermon culminated with an Advent theme. Someone, someone is coming who is greater and more powerful than I. We know he meant Jesus. But Jesus said in Luke 7, Among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Is Jesus contradicting John? Who is it that is really greater? Jesus or John? We might say that Jesus is greater and we would be right. John rightly honors his Lord and Savior, saying that he is not worthy to untie his sandals. Only a slave, and a non-Jewish slave, was expected to take off the master's shoes and wash his dirty feet. John is saying he's not even worthy to be Jesus' slave. And he's right. None of us are. None of us are in our sin, worthy to come anywhere near the Holy One of God. Jesus is surely greater. He is without sin. He is God of God, Lord of lords, light of light. Jesus is surely greater. But what Jesus says is true too. 
The one who is least in the kingdom is greater than even the greater, greatest prophet, John. The one who is least in the kingdom is the one who is the servant, the slave of all. And who is least in the kingdom? It has to be Jesus. He who makes himself the servant, the slave of all of us. He who knelt to undo the thongs of his disciples' sandals and then wash their feet. He who knelt in prayer in the garden in submission to his Father's will. He who submitted to arrest and torture and death, ultimately, on a cross to serve all mankind with his great love. He became the least in the kingdom, despised, rejected, stricken, smitten, afflicted, shamed, ridiculed, scorned, forsaken. He became sin to make us holy. He became the sacrificial lamb of God to make us the children of God. He became the least to make us great. Today, the prophetic voice of John can still be heard when you, the Christ follower, the Christian, point people to Jesus. When repentance is called for and you offer forgiveness, it's always based on one greater than ourselves, one who we are not worthy to serve, but who served us so greatly. We preach forgiveness and we baptize in his name according to his command. We also proclaim his presence in the sacramental meal, that mysterious presence of Christ truly among his people. And we too remind the faithful that just as Christ once came, and though he is gone, yet his twofold promise still stands. One, I will always be with you. Did you hear that? I will be with you always. And two, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come back to take you to be with you. Isn't that wonderful news? God's promises given to us. He is with us always. and He will come back for us. American culture sees Santa as the sign that Christmas is coming. But the church sees John as the sign that Jesus is coming. I think John still gives many Christians pause, though. We think about his odd appearance and habits. We mold the meaning of his baptism. And we wonder just how it all fits together. But let us also, in this Advent season, ponder the message, the sermon of John. Repent, for someone greater is coming. And let us put our faith and trust and hope in that one, in Jesus Christ, our servant and our Lord. Repent and be forgiven, for he is near. Amen. Let us now pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we give thanks this day for calling us and the whole world to repentance and faith by your holy prophets, by your servant, John the Baptist, and by your own son, whose spirit calls, gathers, and enlightens everyone through his mighty word and sacraments. Grant that we and all who hear his voice remain faithful in the fellowship of your holy church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Continue to give your blessing, power, and grace to your church, especially the servants you have called and given to guard, feed, and teach your flock. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Give stability to our country, supplying all who make, administer, and judge our laws with wisdom and goodwill toward all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless the schools of the church and all centers of learning and research that those who teach would serve you honorably and that our common life be conformed to the ways of your truth. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. By your word and spirit, comfort all who are in sorrow, need, sickness, or adversity. Support all who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those to whom death draws near. Give your tender care to all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remembering those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors, we give you thanks. Keep us in fellowship with all your saints and bring us at last to the joys of your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the blessing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's bright, smiling face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace, always and forever. Amen.